The cabin of the old suburban bus was warm, with soft chanson music playing. Driver Buck whistled a tune he liked, glancing in the mirror at the slumbering passengers. Conductor muttered, I'm so tired today. I'm exhausted. My legs are falling off. I talk so much during the day, arguing with passengers, that I don't want to open my mouth at home. But at home, I have housework with my son, and my husband wants dinner. I'm so fed up with everything. Buck shook his head. I don't know. I like my work. I'm honestly telling you. It's all my life on the road. It's so interesting. New people, adventures, no routine and monotony. And Hilda and I have been soul to soul all our lives. Like a thread with a needle. We've been through much together. God never gave us children, but that's okay. We are used to it. But we have a summer house. This year, we harvested so many tomatoes and cucumbers. Now, we're starting to pick apples. We're thinking of making homemade juice in the juice maker, without preservatives. We'll treat our friends. And what a greenhouse I made for my Hilda. You should have seen. No complaints about fate. I'll come in the evening and Hilda will serve me hot soup with fresh bread. And I'll kiss her and hug her. Isn't that happiness? Conductor, I laughed. You're a good man and a positive man, Buck. You've described everything so deliciously. I drooled. And really, why am I nagging? Buck smiled to himself as he thought of his wife. Hilda was the meaning of his life. A faithful friend, counsellor, and beloved woman. They met in their youth at dances. His wife worked as a nurse in a hospital, and it was her calling. She never approached her work formally, and always tried to do everything possible to help the patients recover. Buck couldn't imagine life without the road. It beckoned him like a magnet. He spent his life driving trucks on long trips and earning good money. Hilda faithfully waited for him, worried, prepared sandwiches and coffee for the road, and always greeted him with tears in her eyes. She never once reproached him for choosing a non-family profession. But age took its toll, and it became difficult for Buck to make long-haul trips. So, he got a job as a suburban bus driver. Buck and Hilda had always dreamed of having children. They had been through numerous examinations, and there were no abnormalities or serious diseases, but Hilda never gave birth to a child. There were a couple of miscarriages, and that was it. Buck saw how his wife suffered because of this, although she never showed it. He always reassured her that he loved only her and would never leave her. To take care of someone, they got a funny little dog, Bucky. Hilda sewed him overalls and slippers, walked him in the park and bathed him. Bucky faithfully adored his kind masters. And now the man had finished his last trip and was on his way to the bus garage. Outside, the weather had turned bad, with pouring rain and gusts of wind that swayed the tree branches, making it difficult to see anything. Suddenly, as he was leaving the village, he noticed two figures illuminated by the headlights. It was late in the evening, and there was no bus stop. But nevertheless, Buck pressed the brake. Two individuals, seeing the bus stopped, approached it quickly, it was an old man and a young child, around seven years old, who was limping badly on one leg. What an unusual couple! Where could they be going on foot at such a late hour? Buck thought to himself and opened the door. The drenched wanderers swiftly entered the bus. Despite his limp, the young boy assisted his grandfather and took care of him. The old man remained silent, only gesturing and waving his hands, while pointing at the boy. Finally, the boy spoke. Hello, sir. Thank you for stopping. We've been trying to hitch a ride for an hour. My name is Spencer, and this is my grandfather, Mr. Robbins, and he's very sick. Seriously ill. We need help. Spencer reached into his jacket pocket, pulled out a piece of paper, and handed it to Buck. Please, help us. Take us to the bank on Green Street. It's a matter of life and death. Buck read the message and looked at the travellers thoughtfully. Suddenly the boy cried out, Sir, don't leave us here. Help us get to the bank. We really need it. Buck's heart trembled, and he firmly stated, I'll help you. No problem. My name is Buck, 
but the bank is closed at night anyway. Let's go to my house, spend the night, and tomorrow morning I'll take you where you need to go. The elderly man raised his hands to the sky, as if in gratitude, and nodded his head. The child also rejoiced and stopped crying, saying, Yes, thank you, you're so kind, but please, let me take this little puppy with me. I found him behind the bus stop in a cardboard box. Someone must have abandoned it. I can't leave him here, it will starve to death, or be tormented by mean boys. Tears welled up in the experienced driver's eyes, and he marvelled. What a small but kind and caring heart. He's in trouble himself, yet he's trying to rescue a puppy. That means a lot. Aloud, the man cheerfully responded, You're right, we can't leave a friend behind. I have a dog at home too. I love him very much, and I hope my Bucky will become friends with your puppy. Meanwhile, the little puppy timidly peeked out from under the boy's jacket and whimpered. The boy gently stroked its wet fur and whispered, Don't be afraid, Duke. You're with me now. Everything will be all right. You see, I didn't deceive you. You're my friend now, the most loyal one. Throughout the trip, the elderly man dozed off, and Buck asked the boy, Why are you limping? Should I take you to the hospital and let the doctors have a look? The child shook his head and began to explain. It happened a year ago when I fell off my bike. I had a cast on my leg, but something didn't heal properly according to the doctors. That's why I limp. I don't need to go to the hospital. I have a vital task. When Buck arrived home with his guests and the puppy, Hilda was astonished, blinking repeatedly, but welcomed everyone, saying, Good evening. What a surprise. Buck, are these your friends? Why didn't you call and let me know? I would have prepared a special dinner. I'll set the table right away. Oh, and who's peeking out from behind your jacket? The boy said, I'm Spencer. Grandpa's name is Mr. Robbins, and this is my duke. He's hungry. I feel so sorry for him. The woman said, Let's wash him first, otherwise he'll get all the carpets dirty. Come on, Spencer. Help me, please. In half an hour, everyone enjoyed a delicious dinner, followed by tea and candy. The puppy had already eaten enough of Bucky's food and had been sniffing around on the bed for a while. The dog surprisingly accepted Puppy, sniffed him for a long time, then licked his nose and settled down. Hilda prepared a bed for the guests and hung their belongings to dry. After their adventurous day, Spencer fell asleep as soon as his head touched the pillow, feeling safe. The next morning, Buck had the day off and decided to accompany their new friends to the bank to ensure that Spencer would be heard and not turned away. The bank was located in the town centre, and although it wasn't well known, it had its fair share of clients. At first, they encountered problems with the guard at the entrance. The little kid pleaded, Let me go directly to the banker. I have a personal matter for him. It's very important. The guard responded angrily, What kind of circus are you trying to create here? Wait in line like everyone else. Buck decided to intervene. Excuse us, but this is a complicated case. You see, the elderly man is mute and can't speak, but the boy will explain everything. Please, let us go to her without waiting in line. It's a matter of life and death. The guard waved his hand and took them straight to the head manager, Mr. Rotundi. Once everyone was seated in the office, a stern man with a bald head and glasses asked unhappily, So, what brings you here? And be quick, I don't have much time. Spencer took out a folder with documents from his backpack and handed it to the manager, saying, Here, these are all the documents my grandmother gave me. Please give me her money. She kept it here. Grandma's in the hospital and she needs an emergency operation. The banker reluctantly examined the papers for a long time. There was indeed an account number, details, grandmother's passport, and a power of attorney allowing her husband to access the deposit on her behalf. Everything seemed to be in order. However, the manager was hesitant to release a large sum of money as it generated good interest for the bank through loans to other clients. I won't give you any money now, he said sharply. Bring Mrs. Robbins here. All of this looks like a fake power of attorney to me. 
Otherwise, I'll press the panic button, and you'll have to explain yourselves to the police. Have a lovely day. You're free to leave. The upset kid started to cry, tears welling up in his eyes as he protested. I'm not lying. My grandmother is sick and she needs help. She told me that she's been saving for years. Why don't you believe me? Buck also stepped in, saying, Put yourselves in the shoes of those less fortunate. Don't you have any compassion? Especially since the documents are all in order. Why can't they withdraw the money? The manager called the guard and turning to Buck, he hissed, Who are you, sir? Why are you so protective of this kid? If it's so urgent, let the account holder come and close it. The conversation is over. There was shouting and Spencer's crying. Nevertheless, the guard ushered everyone out, and Buck questioned the crying boy. Spencer, why didn't you tell us about your grandmother earlier? Let's go to her. Maybe we can help her ourselves. Through his tears, the boy explained, My grandmother told me to keep quiet and not tell anyone about the deposit or talk about her. She was worried that thieves or bandits might rob us. Buck took a piece of paper and a pen and gave all this to Mr. Robbins so that he could write the hospital information. And they went to the hospital right away. Unfortunately, they received the sad news. The tired doctor sadly explained, I'm very sorry to say this, but Mrs. Robbins' heart failure has worsened, probably due to stress, and she has suffered a heart attack. She is now in critical condition in the intensive care unit. Upon hearing this news, the Spencer's grandfather clutched his chest and then collapsed. The nurses quickly placed him on a stretcher, and the doctor ordered, Take him to the examination room immediately. There appears to be another patient with a heart condition. Give me the man's papers. I think we need to admit him to our department. Spencer cried out and whispered, Grandpa, hold on. Why are you leaving me alone? Where am I supposed to go now? I don't want to go to Mum. She will beat me again. Hilda, who had arrived at the hospital too, embraced the boy, pulling him close and stroking his head, trying to calm him down. Don't cry, Spencer. No one is going to leave you. You will come with us and stay for a while. Grandpa needs to get better too. You can see how weak he is. We will visit him and try to help your grandmother. Buck took the doctor aside and asked, Tell me honestly, how much money is needed for the operation and treatment? We don't have much at the moment, but I really want to help the poor boy and save his grandmother. The doctor didn't try to sugarcoat the situation and replied, I don't know how her body will respond, but the situation is very difficult, especially considering her age. She's already over 80, but we can't delay it any longer. I'm not even sure how she will tolerate such a difficult surgery, but it's worth a try. Excuse me, I'll be right back. Her husband is also in poor health. We need to help him. Buck and Hilda, being simple people with limited means, started calling their acquaintances and loyal friends for help. Through their collective efforts, they managed to raise the necessary funds for the operation. They were overjoyed, especially Spencer, who held on to the hope that his grandparents would recover soon. However, the miracle did not happen. Buck and Hilda were only half a day too late. When they rushed to the hospital to inform the doctor that they had the money and could schedule the operation, it was already too late. Mrs. Robbins had passed away. This news was a devastating blow to everyone, especially Spencer. He sobbed uncontrollably, burying his face in Hilda's shoulder and shouted, It's all that bad sir's fault! If he had given grandmother's money in time, she'd still be alive! I hate him! I hate him! But the troubles didn't end there. Three days later, Mr. Robbins also passed away, joining his wife in heaven. Spencer was filled with sorrow and became withdrawn. Hilda did her best to comfort him and then gently asked, Spencer, where are your parents? We need to inform them about the deaths of your grandparents. They will want to say their goodbyes and arrange their burial. Where do you live? However, at the mention of his parents, the boy became restless and replied, We live in the village. My mum drinks a lot and then she fights. 
My grandparents often got into trouble because of her. She pulls me by my ear and calls me a lazy bastard. And my dad is in jail. I don't want to go home. Don't send me back. I'll run away anyway. Mummy is mean and she doesn't like anyone. She hated Grandma and Grandpa. She took away their pensions and beat them. Spencer covered his face with his hands and sobbed inconsolably, saying, Nobody needs me in Duke. Only Grandma and Grandpa loved me, and Mummy doesn't need me. Hilda felt immense pity for this poor little boy who had lost the two most important people in his life. She held him tightly and whispered, Don't say that, Spencer. We need you and little Duke. We don't have children of our own, but we will love you and won't give you to anyone. Look, Duke likes to live here too. He and Bucky are friends now. They even sleep on the same bed. Spencer looked at Hilda with tears in his big blue eyes and asked, Are you really not going to leave me? I promise to behave and not be spoiled. I even know how to fry potatoes and wash the floor. Hilda was astonished by the amount of sorrow that this little boy had experienced and replied, Spencer, children shouldn't wash the floor. They should play, learn and enjoy life. That's what childhood is for. Don't worry, Buck and I are here. Everything will be fine. You'll see. Hilda and Buck consulted each other and decided to find out everything to be themselves. What if the child is in shock after the death of his beloved grandparents? Maybe he is just resentful towards his mother, and perhaps it's not as bad as it seems. It was difficult to believe that a mother could be so terrible that her child would hate her and not want to live with her. Unbelievable. Buck sensibly thought that if the family was dysfunctional, then the local police officer must be a frequent visitor at their house. The man decided to speak with him first and immediately went to meet him at the local police station. Paul listened attentively to Buck and sighed heavily. I'm so sorry about Mr. and Mrs. Robbins. They were such decent people. Mrs. Robbins was a local teacher, retired long ago. She taught me and even my children math. Mr. Robbins was a locksmith with golden hands. But their daughter is something. Since childhood, she's been nothing but trouble. First, fights with other kids. Then, running away from home. And then, starting from the age of 15, getting into all sorts of mischief. She ran away to the city and came back with a boyfriend and pregnant. His name was Tony. Her parents arranged a wedding for them and they could live in peace. But Megan was never satisfied. She had a craving for trouble. She started drinking and taking something, neglected Spencer and was seen with strange men. Tony became terribly jealous of her, so he started drinking too. And then, once being drunk, he beat her suitor to death. They put him in jail, and he'll be there for a long time. And after that, Megan completely lost control. Mrs. Robbins often complained to me, hiding the beatings under her sweaters. I scared Megan more than once. I visited them often, warning her that Spencer would be taken away and placed in an orphanage. But she didn't care. She just kept saying, Let them take him away. Tony's brat. I don't need him for anything. I didn't even want him. Buck shook his head. He was shocked by the hell that Spencer had been enduring all these years. Meanwhile, the policeman said, Well, let's go and visit the grieving daughter. We need to inform her about her parents' death. Maybe her conscience will finally awaken and she'll start acting more responsibly. They went to the once well-maintained but now neglected house. The windows were covered in dirt and the yard was overgrown with weeds. The policeman knocked on the window for a long time before he heard a hoarse voice say, Who's there? Paul sternly shouted, Open up, Megan, it's the policeman. Hurry up. Did you drink again last night with your friends? Where is your son? Don't you care at all? A fat, disheveled and grumpy woman appeared on the doorstep. She reeked of sweat and alcohol. Buck recoiled, feeling almost sick. Megan looked at them with a cloudy, not quite sober glaze, and reluctantly replied, What do you want? Well, we had a few drinks last night. 
It was my friend's birthday. What's wrong with that? And Spencer and his grandfather have gone somewhere. Paul responded sharply. Megan, shame on you. While you're drinking, your parents died in the hospital, and your son is an orphan with a mother who's still alive. The woman hiccuped and angrily retorted. Huh? But I haven't any money to bury them. Let the state take care of it. And I'll take Spencer, of course. I'll get an allowance for him. I won't be receiving my parents' pension any more, so I need something to live on. Buck looked at the police officer, and without words, he understood. He frightened Megan by saying, You'll never get Spencer back. He is still in the orphanage. You dumped everything on his elderly grandmother and his sick grandfather, and now you won't even try. The woman suddenly grinned and shouted, Oh, really? Well, then get out of here and bury them yourself, and I'll take Spencer anyway. Buck was horrified and said to Paul, What kind of mother is this? She doesn't even look like a woman. Listen, Spencer is afraid of her and hates her. He begs us not to leave him. We may not be rich, but we're decent people. We love the boy as if he were our own. How could we adopt him? Can you imagine what will happen to him if Megan takes him? What will Spencer grow up to be? A criminal, an alcoholic? We will bury Mrs. and Mr. Robbins ourselves with all due respect, since their own daughter doesn't care about them. The policeman sighed heavily and replied, You're right about everything. We can't return the boy to this troubled mother. I'll try to help you. I'll gather testimonies from all the villagers. Meanwhile, you should collect the necessary adoption documents and work towards revoking Megan's maternal rights. She doesn't need Spencer for anything other than the child allowance. I'll do what I can to assist with the funeral. They should be buried in their native village, where they lived their whole lives. I'll organize a funeral service in the church, and we'll hold a wake in the canteen to honor them. Thank you, Buck, for caring so much about them and about Spencer. I'm surprised you're not even related to them. It's a rare thing these days. Buck hesitated and replied quietly, We're all human beings. We all walk under God. Hilda and I were not blessed with children of our own, and it appears that Spencer was left to us as a son or a grandson. I believe there are no chance meetings. The policeman took care of everything, and the elderly couple were laid to rest properly. Half the village attended the wake. As everyone began to leave the cemetery, Megan appeared. She sobbed and wrung her hands, but the villagers looked at her with disapproval. Spencer saw his mother and immediately hid behind Hilda's back. But Megan saw her son and stumbled towards him, spreading her arms and shouting in a slurred voice, Spencer, my son, so you're not in an orphanage. Come to your mummy. I missed you so much. I don't want to. You're bad. You don't love me. I'll live with Hilda. She is kind and won't abandon me. Megan became furious upon hearing her son's words. Like a madwoman, she threw herself at Spencer, saying, Hey, you little brat, I'm not going to repeat twice. Go home! Then Megan turned to Hilda and hissed, And who are you? Why are you playing Mother Teresa? What do you want with my son? You're counting on his allowance, aren't you? Give me Spencer, or I'll pull your hair out. She stepped to grab Hilda's hair, but Buck and the villagers quickly intervened, pulling Megan away. The district officer escorted her away from the cemetery, saying, Go away, and don't embarrass yourself. You're completely drunk. Aren't you ashamed? You can't afford the funeral, but you have money for drink. The drunken woman spewed curses. Decency, love, and care had long been erased from her intoxicated mind. She always felt that her parents hindered her from living life the way she wanted. She also didn't want a son. He was a nuisance to her, demanding attention and affection. But now, when she realised that he could be taken away, she suddenly felt resentful. Who gave them the right? But nevertheless, Buck and Hilda managed to get custody of Spencer. They collected all the necessary documents with the help of the district police officer. The villagers also supported them by saying that Megan was an unfit mother and a drunkard who couldn't be trusted with the child. As a result, Megan was deprived of her parental rights in the trial. Hilda and Buck adopted Spencer 
and started raising him as their own son, even though they were already in old age, and the boy resembled a grandson to them. The money that Hilda and Buck collected for Mrs. Robin's operation, they decided to use for Spencer. They wanted to have him examined and get his leg treated. The boy longed to be like everyone else, to jump and run carefree, ride a bicycle and play soccer with his friends. The doctor reassured them, but also warned that the treatment would be long and stretch over several months. But Spencer was willing to endure it all, just to become healthy again. Hilda and Buck supported him, not letting him lose hope, even when his leg was very painful after the operation. Faithful Duke was always by his side, sensing how difficult it was for his young master. The dog faithfully licked his hands and curled up on his knees, resting his head on his belly and barking playfully. Spencer adored his dog, hugging him tightly and teaching him commands. Duke was his most loyal and devoted friend. And the boy was also pleased in his new family. He finally learned what it was like to live in a family where there was no scolding, scandals, drunkenness or bullying. No one offended anyone. He idolized Hilda. She cooked deliciously, did a lot with him and took care of him. They had conversations, read fairy tales and children's encyclopedias together. The boy dressed and groomed well, just like ordinary kids. After three months, his leg healed with the help of physical therapy and massages, and Spencer began to walk normally. Buck enrolled him in the swimming pool, where the kid had a lot of fun. He loved being in the water, swimming and diving for hours. He hardly remembered his mother, Megan, as he was so content and calm in his new family, as if he was born there. He often visited his grandparents' grave with Buck. Duke, the skinny little puppy, had grown into a large, beautiful dog with brown hair, but he still liked to climb onto his master's lap, even though he didn't fit there any more. It was touching when Spencer stroked and scratched him behind the ear, whispering, Duke, my little friend, I love you so much. Buck and Hilda even seemed to have grown younger themselves, because now there was someone to live for. Hilda was radiant when she spent time with Spencer, when he named her mother and sought her advice. The boy turned out to be very clever, excelling in his studies, and on weekends they all spent time together at the summer house. Spencer grew accustomed to work from an early age and eagerly helped in the vegetable garden. He skillfully weeded flowers and carrots, assisted his new mother with watering and found joy in it all. The boy especially enjoyed grilling kebabs and baking potatoes in the yard with his foster father. It brought him great delight. Spencer always took on an important role turning the meat. The dogs also had a lot of fun there. They ran freely, digging the ground, lying amusingly in the sand, and raced to fetch sticks with their teeth. Life continued as usual. However, Megan never settled down. She kept drinking and held a grudge against her son, considering him a traitor. She fiercely hated the family that took him away. One day, as usual, the local police officer arrived to disperse the drunken company at her house. He scolded the vicious woman and said in his heart, Megan, you have no sense of responsibility. Hilda and Buck are raising your son. Your parents were buried with their own money, and not a penny was withdrawn from Mrs. Robin's bank deposit. And you continue to drink and don't care. Who do you think you are? Megan's eyes greedily lit up. What deposit? she asked. Does my mother have money in the bank? Why don't I know about this? I live here impoverished, struggling to get by, while there is a deposit in the bank? The policeman waved his hand and said, Get a job. You're a healthy woman. Then you'll have money. Smarten up. I won't tell you anything more. Paul restored order, calmed the neighbours and left, while Megan pondered intensely. She began rummaging through her late mother's belongings and documents, searching for any clue to find out where her mother kept the money. The woman was determined to get the deposit at any cost. Suddenly it occurred to her that her deceased father must have taken the documents when he left, and now all the papers were in Buck's house. A plan matured in the mind of the foolish mother. She cleaned herself up and went to town. She bought a cheap toy car and began watching the house. 
During the trial, she heard exactly where her son now lived. Megan hid on a bench in the public garden and started waiting. Finally, she saw the car pull up. Buck dropped Spencer off and drove away. The boy went into the entrance, and Megan rushed after him and traced which apartment the boy had entered. She listened, and it was quiet, indicating that Spencer was alone. Megan saw this as an opportunity, and she rang the doorbell firmly. The naive boy didn't even look through the peephole and immediately opened the door. He was frightened and recoiled upon seeing his own mother. He asked, Mum, why did you come here? Inside, Megan felt anger surging through her, realising that her son was clearly not happy to see her. However, she restrained herself and forced a luscious smile, saying, Well, hello, Sonny. I missed you so much. Are you alone at home? Spencer honestly answered. Yes, alone. Hilda went for a walk with the dogs and will be back soon. And Buck went to the gas station. Why did you come here? Megan didn't listen further. She shook the boy and sharply asked, Tell me now, where are the grandfather's documents? The boy, very frightened, blurted out, Daddy's room. Uh, and why do you need them? Grandpa's dead. What are you up to? Go away. Why did you come here? Without paying attention to his words, Megan locked him in the bathroom and propped the door open with a chair. Then she rushed to the bedroom, searching for the documents she needed, and quickly found them in the closet, in a prominent place. Megan grinned and ran away, not paying attention to the crying Spencer. The boy kept pounding his fists on the door and shouting, Open up! Mum! Open the door, I'm scared! What are you doing there? Why did you come here? Megan only shouted back as she ran away. Nothing! Sit down and think about how you betrayed your mother. I'm doing what I need to. In twenty minutes, Hilda came back from her walk with the dogs. They were tearing off their leashes and barking frantically, sensing the presence of a stranger. The woman didn't understand what had happened. The door was open, but she heard Spencer crying. Mummy, is that you? Duke, Bucky, open the door, I'm in the bathroom. Hilda rushed to the bathroom and let her son out. He immediately threw himself on her neck and began to sob. She comforted him and asked, Sonny, don't cry. You were scared, my little one, but everything is over now. What happened? Who came? Were we robbed? Spencer told her everything, sobbing. You won't scold me for opening the door, right? I thought Mum missed me, so she found me. I, I was surprised, but she locked me up and searched for Grandpa's papers in your bedroom. She is mean. She doesn't like me. I'm afraid of her. Hilda immediately called Buck, who rushed home urgently. They examined everything and found that everything seemed to be in place, except for Mr. Robbins's documents from the bank. The man sadly concluded, Well, it's clear to me. Megan got wind of the money in the bank and decided to take it for herself. I'll call the district police officer now and inform the police. Let them teach her a lesson. Don't worry, son. She won't be here again. While Buck made calls, Megan managed to withdraw the contribution of her mother by some miracle. Now no one could find her. The incident remained deeply ingrained in little Spencer's memory, and his resentment towards his mother carried on throughout his life. He successfully graduated from school with a focus on mathematics and entered the university. He studied economics and banking and received an increased scholarship. Soon, his first love also entered his life. Spencer, along with Duke and Bucky, enjoyed going for a jog in the park early in the morning when the whole city was still asleep. It was there that he met Cathy, a cute student from a pedagogical college who also jogged in the mornings. For a long time, Spencer was modest and shy, afraid to talk to her. He simply admired the slim, flexible body and luxurious long hair of this charming brunette. Their introduction was facilitated by the friendly and huge Duke. The dog caught up with the young runner, wagged his tail and rubbed his nose against her. She stroked him and laughed, saying, "'What a good dog! What's your name, my friend? Too bad I don't have any treats, or I would give you one.' Spencer immediately replied, This is Duke, my faithful friend. I raised him from a little puppy, 
and this is small Bucky, also my pet, and my name is Spencer. I live nearby. The girl smiled and said, That means we're neighbours, because I also live not far from here. My name is Kathy. Nice to meet you. Spencer had made up his mind and said, I'd like to meet you tonight, because I really like you. Can we go to the movies or a concert? Or maybe just go for a walk? Do you mind? The girl was pleased and replied, I have a better offer. Come visit today for my sister's birthday. She's twelve years old and we're having a fun gathering with contests and karaoke. I'll be waiting for you at eight. Spencer felt embarrassed and said, I don't know, it's embarrassing. I don't know your sister at all. Maybe she won't be glad to see me. Kathy laughed and reassured him. Oh no, don't worry. Jenny is happy to have guests. Every visit is a huge holiday for her. When you come, you'll find out why. Spencer brought flowers and a set of girls' cosmetics as a gift. He went to visit, feeling nervous and anxious about the people he would meet and how he would be received. But for the sake of being with Kathy, he was ready for anything. She had deeply touched his soul. Exactly at six, Spencer knocked on the door. Kathy opened it looking beautiful with her flowing hair and minimal makeup. Spencer entered the room and asked, Hello, where's the birthday girl? I want to congratulate her. To his surprise, a cute little girl came to greet him while sitting in a wheelchair. She listened to the congratulations with embarrassment and gladly accepted the gift. Then she squinted and asked, So, you're Kathy's fiancé, right? She's so secretive that she doesn't tell us anything. Sit down at the table, I'll introduce you to everyone. They are mostly Kathy's friends, but they're all very nice. Hardly anyone comes to see me. If it weren't for my sister, I'd go crazy. The holiday was fun and relaxed. Spencer quickly made friends with everyone and participated in contests. Only at the end of the evening, when he was alone with Kathy in the kitchen, did he quietly ask, And what about Jenny? Has she been sick since childhood? She's such a good girl, I feel sorry for her. Kathy sighed and explained, No, Jenny used to do gymnastics and was very promising. She even had potential to compete, but she had an unfortunate accident during practice and suffered a spinal injury. We've taken her to many doctors, and they all say she needs time and expensive treatment. So we are now collecting money with the whole family and friends. I must help her, because I adore Jenny, and believe she will walk again. Spencer praised Kathy, saying, You're very kind. I also had a severe limp as a child, because my leg didn't properly heal, so I know how terrible it is to be looked down upon and pitied. My adoptive parents helped me a lot, and I'm grateful to them. Otherwise, I would have limped my whole life. So I won't stand by either. I'll help in any way I can. From that day on, Kathy and Spencer began dating, and their tender and caring relationship lasted for years. Spencer introduced his fiancée to Hilda and Buck, who, upon learning about Jenny's situation, also contributed to raising money. With the support of their loved ones, they managed to raise the necessary funds for Jenny's treatment, and finally the courageous girl regained her ability to walk. Time flew by, and Spencer graduated from the university. He got a job as a junior manager at the very bank where he was refused to get his grandmother's money. The head of the bank, Mr. Rotundi, who was still the same unpleasant and grouchy man with glasses, did not recognise the young specialist as the same boy who had once asked him for money, and meanwhile Spencer had his own plan. The young man dedicated himself to his work, excelling in his role and swiftly climbing the career ladder, and at the same time he collected evidence of the head's misconduct, uncovering his dark schemes and manipulations. Spencer meticulously made copies of the evidence and compiled them in a black folder. A year later, Spencer resolutely took the folder to the prosecutor's office. The whole chain of manipulations was unravelled, and many dishonest people were deprived of their positions. As a result of his bravery and integrity, Spencer was appointed manager because at that time he was the most successful worker in the bank. Mr. Rotundi was furious and shouted in Spencer's face, Where did you come from? 
Why did I hire you in the first place? Are you the most honest here? Or do you not need money? Spencer looked intently at the manager and replied, You don't recognise me, right? Many years ago, I came to your bank with a mute grandfather begging you to give me my grandmother's deposit. There was a scandal then, don't you remember? You refused me, threw me out, even though I had all the necessary documents. But you violated the instructions and treated me like a worthless kitten. My grandmother died all because of you, and my grandfather died soon after. The manager turned pale and sat down in his chair, remembering the incident. He began to apologise, saying, So that's it. You grew up and decided to take revenge on me, did you? I didn't want to release the money from circulation. I repent. It was a substantial amount, but I never thought someone would die because of it. I'm sorry. Can I make it up to you? I'll give you the money. Just take back your statement. Spencer laughed and said, You know what? I'm actually grateful to you in a way. Your despicable act motivated me to study and work at the bank. I decided not to seek revenge, but to restore justice. People like you, greedy for other people's money, shouldn't ruin lives. Now the police will sort it out. Please leave my office. Have a nice day. The ex-head fidgeted in his chair, realising that he had burned all his bridges. He tried to soften the situation, saying, But listen, Spencer, a woman named Megan Robbins came later and claimed that deposit. So technically your family got all the money. Don't be so hot-headed. Take back your statement. Spencer clapped his hands and replied, Bravo, you've just confessed to another fraud. And how did she get the money? If she had the power of attorney for my grandfather, my mother had nothing to do with it. That's the answer because you took a fee from her. A part of the deposit, didn't you? Mr. Rotundi, you will be held legally responsible for everything. If only you knew how much I hated you throughout my childhood, and how I dreamed of retribution. Well, it has happened. I will change everything here. No more black schemes and fraud. Everything will be fair. The ex-head of the bank was prosecuted for fraud and sentenced to a long prison term. Spencer became the head manager. Kathy also graduated from college and became a history teacher at a school. At their wedding, happy Hilda and Buck sat at the festive table and quietly cried with emotion and joy as they watched the newlyweds dance a waltz. Buck whispered to his spouse, What a wonderful son we have raised, Hilda. Handsome, clever, a sportsman, our pride. It's wonderful how we crossed paths with Spencer on the road. Hilda held her beloved man tighter and said, That's right, Buck. We have lived a long life together and stopped dreaming of having children. We were both over fifty. But it seems fate took pity on us and brought Spencer into our lives. And look how many years have passed. I was thinking, Buck, let's move to the countryside for good. We have chickens in our own vegetable garden. Maybe our grandchildren will be visiting us, if we're still here. Buck hugged his faithful wife and replied, I'm all for it. I've long dreamed of having an apiary, at least a couple of beehives. I've read so much literature and I really want to try this, especially now that we're retired. I'm so lucky to have you, Hilda. No one has ever understood me like you have. And so they did. They took Duke, an old blind Bucky, and moved to the countryside. Buck diligently learned about beekeeping from the local beekeepers and didn't forget to help Hilda. They worked on their new life, slowly but happily. Spencer and Kathy had a long-standing tradition of visiting their family on weekends. One day, Hilda overworked herself and fell ill, experiencing severe back pain that made it impossible for her to straighten up. Concerned, Spencer took her to the hospital, where Hilary, an old acquaintance of Hilda, worked in the emergency room. As Hilary attended to Hilda, she shared the latest gossip. The doctor will examine you now, including x-rays and a CT scan if necessary. However, it's most likely just aggravated rheumatism. Your son is worrying about nothing. Despite the pain, Hilda smiled and replied, I know, it's not the first time, but Spencer is a caring son. 
he rushes me to the hospital and buys me medications and vitamins before I even have a chance to complain. Hilary remarked, You're lucky, Hilda. By the way, I completely forgot to tell you that in our department, in the fifth ward, Spencer's bio mother lies with a fracture. It's scary. Just horrible. She looks like a homeless woman. It's a good thing you adopted the boy, or he could have ended up like her. Spencer overheard the conversation but kept it to himself. However, when Hilda was taken for an x-ray, he couldn't resist and peeked into that very fifth ward. He was horrified to see an elderly woman with deep wrinkles and dishevelled grey hair. Her gaze was angry and unpleasant. She stared at him intently and muttered, not recognising her own son. What are you looking at? Spencer shuddered and replied, I'm sorry, I must have mistaken the ward. He left, closed his eyes, and memories of childhood beatings and slaps flooded his mind. He could only hear the phrase, Tone is brat, echoing in his ears. He also remembered his beloved grandparent, whom his mother terribly treated. The woman in the fifth ward only evoked disgust and repulsion in his soul. When they brought Hilda back from the X-ray room, Spencer immediately rushed to her and anxiously asked, How are you, Mum? What did the X-ray show? What did the doctor say? Hilda reassured him, saying, Don't worry, sweetheart, it's just rheumatism. I must have strained myself and caught a cold. The doctor prescribed ointments and injections, and let me go home. Spencer sat down next to her, kissed the hands that once comforted him in childhood, and tenderly said, Thank God, I was so worried about you. You are the closest and most beloved person to me, along with Dad. Let's go home now, and no gardening for today. Hilda cried, feeling a sense of relief in her soul. Even her back seemed to hurt less. She whispered to him, Thank you, my dear, for finding and choosing us, for making us so happy. We love you too. I promise I won't do any weeding today. Spencer helped his mother get comfortable in the car, placing a pillow under her aching back. Then he returned to the hospital for a moment. He handed Hilary some money and whispered, This is for the patient from the fifth ward. The woman questioned, Your mother? You should have given it to her yourself. Spencer furrowed his brow and replied, My mother is in the car. This is for a woman in the fifth ward. He turned around and left without looking back. Hilary sighed and thought, Well, of course, this is not a mother who gave birth, but the one who stayed up all night, cared for and loved. That's the law of life. Throughout the journey, Spencer couldn't shake the image of his biological mother's puffy, dark, drunken face. He thought to himself, How fortunate I am to have Hilda as my mum. Otherwise, I wouldn't have grown up into a good person with a mum like that. The next day, Spencer went to the village to visit his grandparents' graves. He spent an hour tidying up the cemetery. Afterward, he sat on a bench, sighed softly, and gazed at the photo of his grandparents. Grandma, Grandad, it's such a pity that you left this world so soon. I would have made you the happiest. You loved me so sincerely. Let me tell you a story. And he shared the story of his encounter with his birth mother, expressing all his emotions and his profound love for Hilda. Suddenly, the world seemed bright again, and even the sun peeked out from behind the clouds. Grandma listened, happy for her grandson. <laughs>